reading of the word. It's from the book of Acts, chapter 1, verse 1 to 11 today. I'll be reading from the Christian Standard Bible. I wrote the first narrative, Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up after he had given instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After he had suffered, he also presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. While he was with them, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for the Father's promise, which, he said, you have heard me speak about, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit in a few days. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, are you restoring the kingdom of Israel at this time? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you. Anyone? The children's discipleship song. You will receive power. Sorry, it just uh, popped up in my head. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. After he had said this, he was taken up as they were watching and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going, they were gazing into heaven. And suddenly, two men in white clothes stood by them. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up into heaven? This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come in the same way that you have seen him going into heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Praise be to God should be your response. We are in week five of our current series called That's Great News. We said in the beginning of the series, so let me say it again, that we believe that Christ is enough to sustain us through the valleys and hardships of our lives. We believe that Christ is enough to refresh and revitalize us in hard seasons of what we call disorientation. Let's be honest. Let me give it to you in proper job, Pretoria vernacular. People are feeling pop at the moment. Okay? It's a strange time of year for us as a collective, us as a church, us as a country. And we believe that the gospel is not pop. On the contrary. We believe that the gospel has the ability to renew us and to revive us in this time. This series is also positioned to be an open and a welcoming and a loving space for people who do not believe in Jesus or people who might be seeking and wondering what the Christian faith is all about because we are explaining the real basics of the Christian faith by using the historical markers of Jesus' life. His birth, life, death, Resurrection, that was week one to four. Ascension, today. And then his return will be next week. So I just want to remind you, hashtag sharing is caring. Whatever we do inside the building on a Sunday, we record. And we hope that you'll share it outside of the building on a different day than Sunday so that people can also hear the good news. Now, I might say the word ascension and you might go, ooh. That's not necessarily what I had in mind this morning. But let me give you a reason why we need to study the ascension and understand it and appreciate it and think about the implications it has for us. Maybe an illustration would be helpful. This is the President of the Republic of South Africa, the Honorable Matamela Cyril Ramaphosa. Okay? This was taken on 15 February 2018. It was his inauguration as president. This happened. It's a historical fact. And that means that we have a president who has the power to decree stuff. He's the boss. He calls the shots. At least according to earthly governance, right? Just work with me. It's an illustration. This also means that whether you like him or not, you need to accept him. And if he decrees stuff, you need to obey him. Because if he decrees stuff and you don't obey him, then you can be charged for treason or for being wrong or for criminal activity or whatever. 
as a citizen of the Republic of South Africa, you've got a problem if you don't honor him as president or if you disobey him as president. The ascension of Jesus is exactly the same. It is a historical fact. It happened. We just read it. People saw it and people wrote it. And Luke started with saying, I am going to write down the continuation of the story of my first volume that I wrote to you. This happened. So I've got a photo for you. It's not original. It's not of the ascension, but it is of clouds. And I think it's quite cool. I mean, a simple unsplash search. Clouds, landscape. This is what it delivered. But it happened. It happened. And that means that Jesus was inaugurated as king and he was given a position of authority whether you like it or not. It's a fact. It was decided by someone else than you. But you have to live in light of that reality. And as citizens of the kingdom of God, we have a problem if we disobey him because he's the boss and he's the king and he says how it works whether we like it or not. So the simple fact that this happened historically and that it has a meaning in the same way that we have a president of this republic, we have to think about the ascension today. And the ascension can't be divorced or uh, 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 untied from our lives as believers. We need to live in light of it. In the same way that I live as a citizen of this country, in light of the fact that President Ramaphosa is our president, I live as a citizen of the kingdom of God, in light of the fact that we have a king who is alive. We studied his resurrection last week, and this week we'll see the beauty of the ascension. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, as we study the scripture now, I pray that we would see you as king, exalted, continuing your work, and that we would be open to work out what that means for us today. Illuminate our minds, our hearts, and our beings as we sit with your word now. I pray that your name would be exalted, King Jesus. Amen. Okay, so, I mean, we do have imaginations as human beings, and we think in pictures, so let me show you some pictures. Two. Firstly, this is a picture of modern-day Jerusalem, taken from the Mount of Olives. So we are now on the Mount of Olives. This picture was taken by one of Marie and my friends, called Rihanna, when we visited this spot in person, in the flesh, in November of 2014. It was a phenomenal trip. So this is the, we are on the Mount of Olives now. Then there's a valley that runs here. It's called the Kidron Valley. And in the Kidron Valley, there's Gat Shemanim, the Garden of Olives, Gethsemane. And this is Jerusalem. And this is what is called the Temple Mount, also referred to as Zion in the Bible. Currently, there's a mosque on there called the Dome of the Rock. And then you've got the Hinnom Valley running here. So we are looking west. T -t 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 going back west. No, I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm going on leave this afternoon, so I'm in a really good mood. That's why you'll see songs just coming out of me spontaneously. But we're looking west from the Mount of Olives. Okay. Let's switch the picture around. Let me show you the second one. This, wait, wait, wait. Sorry, Rudolf. Just, just, just back, please. So there's a part in Jerusalem called the City of David. It's right down here. And the next picture was taken from the city of David back to the Mount of Olives. So let me show you the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives. It's beautiful now, isn't it? Lots of olive trees. That's what's called the Mount of Olives. True story. So this is the Kidron Valley. Our previous photo was taken from up there. Taken down to Jerusalem. So we are now looking east. Okay. To the east, to the east. No, I'm joking. So we're now looking east. This is where the ascension happened. Historically, it's a fact. It's quite a cool picture now, isn't it? Okay, so I'm just going to leave that photo up there. And then I'm going to tell you that we are going to look at six aspects of Jesus' ascension. I will list them for you. 
and then we are going to talk about the implications of it for us. Okay, so I have six and four. I tried to make them ten, and they were too much. Then I tried to make them five, and then it was too little. So I decided to stick with six aspects of the ascension and four implications. Can you guys track with me if we do it that way? Okay, so here's the, th the six aspects of the ascension that we are going to study. Here we go. Jesus continues to work after the ascension. The ascended Lord Jesus sends the Holy Spirit to his people after the ascension. Jesus' ascension is his heavenly enthronement as king. I'll show you. Jesus' ascension is his return to his father. What a glorious reunion that must have been. We'll get there. The ascended Lord Jesus is our heavenly mediator and high priest. That is a beautiful implication of the ascension. And then the ascended Lord Jesus will return as king and judge from where he is now after he ascended. Do you guys get that? Okay. So we are going to get our birds on. What is a bird? A bird is a Bible nerd in Fellowship City language. So we're going to read a lot of scripture today. Track with me. Okay? It'll all be relevant. You'll be able to follow the story. But the only way that I can show you these six aspects of Jesus' ascension is by showing you where it comes from in the Scripture. Okay, so let's do it. First one, Jesus continues to work after the ascension. Look at Acts 1, verse 1 to 2. I think I added some bolds and underlines for you. Come on! Hashtag prep. So look at verses 1 and 2. We'll read that... In the first narrative, this is the Gospel of Luke, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach. Now that word began might seem small to you, but that signals that Jesus' ascension does not mark the cessation or the stopping of His work. But it is the continuation of His work as Lord and Messiah. That's what the book of Acts is all about. Right? We've said before we can call it the Acts of Jesus and the Church. Not really the Acts of the Apostles. Or you can call it the Acts of the Risen Lord Jesus. But here's what you need to know in terms of the Ascension. Is that Jesus works from heaven, through His people, by the Holy Spirit, to accomplish His purposes. He continues to do His work. He didn't leave the Mount of Olives and said, see you later. He left the Mount of Olives and continued his work. And what is his work all about? Look at verse 3. The kingdom of God. This is really important. It was about the kingdom before his death and resurrection. And it's about the kingdom after his resurrection. And what we do here and how we live and how God works through us by his Holy Spirit is all about the kingdom. This is a serious implication for us. Jesus has not stopped working. And He will not stop until the day that He returns and brings everything to a close and then take us into everlasting life with Him. He's still working and it's still about the kingdom. Second point. The ascended Lord Jesus sends the Holy Spirit to His people. So after the resurrection of Jesus... Jesus said to his followers, I'm going to do something. Let me show you. So one slide with a lot of scriptures on them. If they are too small for you to read, then squint. And if squinting doesn't work, then just listen, because I'll read them to you. Okay. Rudolf, do you have them, mate? Yes, please. Okay. So I put them all on one slide for you so that you can see the picture. So Luke 24, 49. And Luke, this is Jesus speaking, I'm sending you what my father promised. As for you, stay in the city until you are empowered from on high. So Jesus said that it would happen. In his Pentecost sermon, the Apostle Peter, right after the Spirit was poured out over everyone, Peter explains what happened here. Look at Acts chapter 2. Verse 33, Peter says, Therefore, since he has been exalted to the right hand of God, this is the ascension, and has received from the Father the Holy Spirit, the promised Holy Spirit, he has poured out what you both see and hear. 
So Peter says, something happened, mentions the ascension, and then he says, after the ascension, something happened, and in that way confirms that Jesus said after his resurrection that this thing will happen. Do you guys see how the Bible confirms the evidence we have? Now, God promised back in the day, amongst other prophets, in Joel 2, chapter 28, look at this promise. After this, I will pour out my Spirit on all humanity. So this is God speaking through the prophet Joel, revealing His will to people. And this specific part of Joel is a vision he saw about something that will happen. And he spoke it, and it was written down, and it was taken up into our Bible. And then your sons and daughters will prophesy, your old men will have dreams, and your young men will see visions. Now this promise is fulfilled by the exalted heavenly Lord Jesus after his ascension. Because the Spirit comes after that in terms of timeline historically. So the ascended Jesus sends the Spirit to be present with His people, like He said He would, to empower them for worldwide mission. Did you read in, chapter, in verse 8 of chapter 1, you will receive power and you will be my witnesses. The ascended Lord Jesus sends the Spirit to transform believers so that their lives can be made new, so that they can be formed into the image of Christ. All of this, only happened after the ascension. So if there was no ascension, there was no pouring out of the Spirit. That's why the ascension is really, really important. Look at verse 5 again. I think I do have a verse 5 highlight. Yes, I do. You will be baptized with the Holy Spirit in a few days. That was the promise. And it did happen. Okay, so second point. The ascended Lord Jesus sends the Holy Spirit. And also love and greetings and grace and peace. I thought that was a good joke. But I mean, I didn't even hear a chuckle or a snort. So I'll stop now with my lame, lame dad jokes. Point three. Jesus' ascension is his heavenly enthronement as king. This is very important. So think about the picture I showed you earlier of the president being inaugurated. This was the enthronement of Jesus as king. Okay? So he is installed as the true king of the world as at his ascension. And it's such an important moment that in one of our historic creeds, a creed is a confession that you say with other people to spell out what you believe. In the Apostles' Creed, the oldest and shortest and most concise uh, uh, confession of the Christian faith, it says, He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. That is what the ascension means. And that fact was taken up into our Christian confessions. So Jesus is taken up to heaven in a cloud. Think of uh, chapter 1 verse 9 to 11. And then later in Acts in chapter 7, Stephen, while testifying and sharing, declares that he sees the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. So we knew it happened historically, we knew what the significance was of it, and now it gets confirmed, I think the fancy schmancy word is corroborated, I think so. If not, we'll just strike that from the video and the podcast. But he corroborates the fact that that is what happened at Jesus' ascension, because he says, I see it. And as Stephen sees it and says it, Everyone who he speaks to at that point was obviously steeped in the Old Testament tradition of the Hebrew Scriptures, right? Because Stephen was testifying in front of the Jewish council. So people who knew the Jewish Scriptures. Now here's a really important text in the Old Testament Jewish Scriptures, or the Hebrew Scriptures if you want to call it that, in Daniel chapter 7, verse 13 to 14. Okay. So these texts, this is now Acts chapter 1 that says that Jesus was enthroned. Acts chapter 7 where Stephen says, I see where Jesus is and what he's doing. These texts suggest that the ascension of Jesus, the ascension of Jesus uh, fulfills this really important prophecy in Daniel chapter 7. So let's read it. It's two verses. I had to keep the, uh, the structure and shape of it because it is poetry, right? You do not justify poetry and put it all in one paragraph because it's a poem. But look at it. This is Daniel now. 
Okay? Perplexed and troubled by living in this foreign kingdom, being oppressed by this foreign ruler, wondering where all of this will end. And here's what he sees. I continued watching in the night visions, and suddenly one like a son of man was coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days, a name for God, and was escorted before him. And he was given dominion and glory and a kingdom, so that those of every people, nation and language should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will not be destroyed. Come on! What a powerful word. Can you imagine sitting in Babylon for almost 70 years, going through everything that Daniel went through, and then getting this vision, saying that there'll be a king one day, and when that king becomes king, he is going to be king forever. That king is Jesus. And that means that his kingdom cannot be destroyed, and it means that his kingdom will not pass away. Revelation 3 says that Jesus conquered, and after he conquered, he sat down with his father on his throne. There he receives unending praise from all the angels and later the saints, and there he will reign at God's right hand until all his enemies are subdued under his feet. These are all scripture references from the Psalms, from the book of Acts, from 1 Corinthians, from Hebrews 1. I just decided that if I give you all of those verse references as well, your head might spin. But this is what the fact that Jesus was inaugurated as king means. So inaugurated through, uh, uh, um, through the enthronement of Jesus, God's kingdom was inaugurated. And he now sits on his, uh, on his heavenly throne and he will return to bring everything to a close, to restore everything and to redeem everything. There's a king here, and you need to accept that, and you need to submit under it, because if you don't, you've got a problem, because you'll be disobeying all the rules of his kingdom. Point four, Jesus' ascension is his return to his father. Look at this. Before and after his death and resurrection, Jesus declares that he was sent by his father and that he must return to his father. Let me show you. John chapter 16, John chapter 20, John chapter 17. Let's look at them. I think I put all of them on one slide. Yes. I came from the father and have come into the world. And again, I am leaving the world and going to the father. Boys going home. John chapter 20. After the resurrection. Okay, so chapter 16 was before. Chapter 20, after. Jesus, speaking to Mary Magdalene, Don't cling to me, Jesus told her, since I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and tell them that I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. I'm going home. I've said it before. Look at John chapter 17. This is between 16, obviously, and 20, like 17. But this is Jesus praying. He said everything that he had to say to his disciples. Like he's wrapped up his sermon. That's me. I'm going to do one prayer now. We're going to go to the garden. I'm going to get arrested, trialed, and I'm going to die. Like this is it. Look at what he says. I have glorified you on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. What a beautiful prayer. God, I'm done. You can come and fetch me. Please. It's a beaut. Look at verse 5. Now, Father... Glorify me in your presence with that glory I had with you before the world existed. So before the world existed, that's where I was. I came here, but I'm done, so please take me back. Can you imagine the sweet reunion of Jesus the Son and God the Father? It must have been a rapper. Ne? Because they were separated in person for the time that Jesus was on earth. I don't think there's been a sweeter reunion in the history of the world. So now, then I tried to think, what can be a great illustration? So I went to comrades again. Ta-da! Surprise, surprise. So I spoke about Tete Morena Dijana earlier. Here we go. He's the winner of the comrades in 2022. 
comes from Mahikeng, currently lives in Rustenburg. Now the beauty of the victory for Tete Di Jama was that he worked full-time as a security guard, and he had the opportunity to become a professional runner. And he decided that he's going to take that opportunity. And he's going to quit his job, he's going to get the sponsorship from Nedbank, and he's going to try his utmost to try and win comrades. And he did it. I mean, just think about that. Leaving his people in Rustenburg, saying, I'm going to go on a mission. And that mission is going to be to run 90 kilometers faster than anyone else on that day. And I'm going to do it. And then I'm going to come back. Can you imagine what his homecoming must have been like? Right? 260k in the right pocket. Another 100k in the left pocket because he was the first South African. Coming home saying, I did what I said I would do. Come on. And I'm home now. I think maybe in like 1%. That must have been like what it was for Jesus to be reunited with his father. Because he did a hard thing on earth. But he did it. And he went home victorious. I think it must have been really, really sweet. And here's the cool thing about the ascension. Is that you and I can take heart because the homecoming of Jesus to his father prepares the way for our homecoming to be with Jesus forever. We will also get that privilege. We will also get this feeling. Look at John chapter 14, verse 2 to 4. This is Jesus speaking. He says, In my Father's house are many rooms. And if it were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? If I go away and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself, so that where I am, you may be also. You know the way to where I am going. We'll go home one day, guys. Well, y'all, because we're not all guys. Ladies and gents, Jesus prepared the way for us. I don't know about you, but I want my homecoming to be sweet. I really want my homecoming to be, dude, you did well. Come here. I love you. That's where you'll hang out for the rest of eternity. If you're looking for Paul, I know you are. You can find Paul there. I also know that you're looking for Peter and Demas and Timothy and Epaphrodites. They're all there. Go and have yourself a blast. And you'll have peanut butter on tap for the rest of eternity. I actually do believe that I'll be able to drink 560 milliliters of peanut butter as much as I want in heaven one day. Smooth, not crunchy. Fifth point. The ascended Lord Jesus is our heavenly mediator and high priest. Note, check, that the exalted Lord Jesus is now in heaven and he's not parting it up in heaven. He's interceding for his people. You need to hear this this morning. He's interceding for his people as our high priest, the true high priest, the one who builds a bridge between us and the Father, and our advocate, the one pleading our case on our behalf. Look at what Hebrews chapter 7 says, verse 24 to 26. He says, but because he remains forever, he's talking about Jesus, he holds his priesthood permanently. Okay, so the writer of Hebrews says, Jesus is a priest, but earthly priests died. And when they died, their priesthood would obviously also discontinue. But Jesus died and rose again, and because he now lives forever, his priesthood will last forever. Look at what he says in verse 25. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him, that's us, since he always lives to intercede for them. For this is the kind of high priest we need, holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. Jesus is a unique mediator between God and man. And his death and resurrection, which we looked at in week 3 and 4, secures our forgiveness, our justification, we are made right in the sight of God, and it secures our reconciliation with God. Right? So the, 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 uh, the relationship is repaired. 
And now, in this in-between time, Jesus intercedes for us. I grew up with two brothers. The one is two years older than I am. The other one is seven years younger. So I've got fond childhood memories of my older brother and I. And I was in grade one when my younger brother was born. So I still have fond memories of him, obviously. But like we were never mates when he was small because I was way older than he was. But I vividly remember that when my brother wanted my dad to listen to him, he would come to me and say, dude, come with me. And let's ask dad together. And then I would go, but dude, I don't want to do what you want to do. And then he says, no, I know, but just come and make the ask. Because if both of us say to dad, this is really what we want, what we want, then he'll give it to us and then you can go play. And I went, okay. That's interceding. That's interceding. Is going with my brother, asking my dad for what he wants, even though I don't want it. But I'm going to ask him. That's what Jesus does for us. Jesus is exalted. He's removed from the sin and pain of this world, right? Obviously, in it still through His Spirit and through us. He doesn't need what we want. But He asks the Father on our behalf for what we want. That is what He does as a heavenly mediator and a high priest. This is powerful. During his earthly ministry, Jesus' work was obviously geographically limited, right? Like, he couldn't teach in Ethiopia while healing someone in China. He was busy doing his work where he was at that point. But now he's at work everywhere. And he's able to hear and to respond to our prayers, no matter the time or place. He sympathizes with our struggles. And he promises to do what we ask him in his name. That's really important. Hebrews 4 says, we have a high priest who knows exactly what it's like to be a human because he was a human. He knows our struggles and he knows our temptations. Have you guys ever heard this? It feels to me like my prayers are bouncing from the roof. I mean, it might be your experience, but it's definitely not the truth. That I can tell you. Because if you feel like your prayers are bouncing from the ceiling then you're not realizing or believing that Jesus hears them, firstly. And secondly, He makes work of them. And He intercedes for us. That is powerful. Sixth point. The ascended Lord Jesus will return as King and Judge. Let me show you. Acts chapter 1, verse 11. Two angels explain to the disciples, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up into heaven? The same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven, will come in the same way that you have seen him going into heaven. So this is what we will look look at next week, the return of Jesus. The heavenly reign of Jesus will one day be fully realized on earth. The book of Revelation tells us that. And Jesus taught us to pray that this would happen. This is the very thing that we ask for when we pray the Lord's Prayer. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's Matthew chapter 6, verse 10. One of the most well-known prayers in the New Testament is the way the New Testament ends. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Come quickly. We also sing that in some of our songs. Because at His return, the Lord Jesus will execute divine judgment. He will vindicate He's downtrodden people, right? He'll help up everyone that the world oppressed. And he'll judge his enemies. And this isn't something that you and I can only think of every now and then. This is something that we have to live in the light of. Because the gospel, the good news, what Jesus did for us, means that we don't have to fear this judgment, but that we can face it with confidence. That's what John says in 1 John. That perfect love drives out fear, especially fear for the coming judgment. Like if you are not a believer, you have to fear the coming judgment because you will not stand. But if you are a believer, we can face the coming judgment with confidence. Because the price has been paid. And a way has been made for us to stand in front of the perfect, holy judge. But we can't only think about this every now and then. We need to live in the light of the fact that Jesus can come back now. And if he comes back now, all of us should go, yes, come on. I've been wanting this day. This is the best day ever. 
Come on, can't wait to go home. That's the way we should be. But if I say to you as a believer, Jesus can come back now, what will your response be? And your response is anything else than what I just described. Then we need to do some work here. And we need to realize that the ascension was step one. The return is step two. But there is a way for us not to fear judgment, but to face it with confidence. Let me show you a little quote from a theologian called Brian Tabb. This is literally a summary of everything I said now. So if you haven't focused up until now, this is the time to focus. The ascension completes the earthly mission and signif uh, sorry, the ascension completes Jesus' earthly mission and it signifies his enthronement as heavenly king. Jesus has completed his father's mission and he now rules with all authority and intercedes with all sympathy as our mediator and high priest. That's a beautiful summary of the ascension and the importance of it. Let me land us with four quick remarks, but very important remarks. The first one, then this is the implication of the ascension of Jesus for our lives. We should remember that Jesus is presently reigning as king. And he remains active, and he remains engaged in our world and in our lives. And that is the truth. And we need to remember to remember because we very easily forget that. Whether it is by negative speech, or news reports, or politics, or government, or economy, or pandemics, or whatever it is that we face, Jesus is still active, and He is still King. And we need to be reminded of that, lest we forget. Second, we can live boldly, confidently, and strategically as servants of the exalted King of Heaven. Why? Because our labors will not be in vain. Because we're serving the right one. <laughs> and the one who will stay on the throne forever. Guys, that's awesome to think that we work for the Kingdom of God and that it will last forever. And what we do now actually matters. I mean, can you imagine if you work in the president's office and then there's a new president? Then all your labors were in vain because there'll just be a next reign and a next reign and a next reign. Not the king of the world. Not the king of the kingdom. Our labors are never in vain because he'll reign forever. I remember meeting a guy one day called Quissy. I forgot Quissy's surname. And I do want to apologize to Quissy if he watches this video after the fact. I'm joking. I met him in Cape Town, and I said to him, how are you doing, Chrissy? And he said, I'm doing phenomenally well. Our king is on the throne. And I thought, that is very Christianese. Cheers. Thank you. But that has stuck with me to this day. Because he meant it. He literally meant it. When I asked him, how are you? He was like, I'm doing absolutely phenomenal. Because Jesus is on the throne. And he rules. And he'll stay there. Third thing. If you are currently a, lots of R's in here, sufferer, a sufferer, suffering, then take heart, because Jesus is not indifferent to your struggle. And this is so important for us to hear. Jesus has endured great suffering, and he is the most merciful and sympathetic counselor and mediator we can have. Please hear me this morning, loud and clear. If you are suffering, take your keys to the ascended Lord who will hear your prayers and can respond with all of heaven's authority. That is so important. You know in South Africa, if people want to make you feel heard, they say, your request has been escalated. Have you ever heard that? Over the telephone or over the email? That's a way of putting people in South Africa to ease. Oh, yeah, yeah, no. We took your complaint or request and we escalated it. Do you guys realize that our prayers get escalated? In a big way. Right to the top. Immediately. And Jesus doesn't lie. It's not like someone writing an email, we've escalated it, and then they don't do it. Our prayers get escalated. 
right to the top. Do not stop praying. Do not stop crying out. Do not stop taking your suffering to Jesus. He's the one to who we want to take this. Fourthly, we have hope in a glorious future. And that is true. The best is yet to come. We cannot be closer to hell than we are now. Because we are headed to heaven. And to life eternally with God himself. And that's really, really important. Jesus will return. And he will return as judge. And he will return as king. And then he will abolish injustice. He will end suffering. He will destroy death. And he'll set up a kingdom that is only about truth and righteousness and love. And it'll be like that forever. Take heart. Because if you are crying out for justice and it's not happening, it will end one day, the injustice. If people are hurting other people and we're creating systems that kills the image bearers of God, take heart because the best is yet to come. And when Jesus comes back, all of this will change. And we will be with our King forever. Because He ascended. That's the perfect ascension for you right there. Let me pray for us. Lord Jesus, when we pray to you now, we realize that you are seated on the throne, that you are the king, that you are the perfect high priest and the most beautiful and sympathetic mediator and counselor we can ask for. So Lord Jesus, whatever it is that's currently living in our hearts and heads, may we bring that to you now. And may we know that you are not indifferent to it. And that you hear us. I pray that you would respond with all of heaven's authority. To what we need now. And I pray that we would cling to the hope of a glorious future with you. Because we know who you are. And we know you are coming back. May we live in the light. Of the fact that you are king. That you have established your kingdom. And that we are citizens of that glorious kingdom. I pray that in your name. Amen.